So Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 26. The word of the Lord. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift. Leave it there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you'll never get out until you've paid the last penny. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Father, uh, you are so good that you would speak to us, that you would continue to speak to us. Um, God, that you are present with us tonight. Uh, God, we do pray for your word to speak, for this teaching of Jesus to actually permeate our hearts and our lives, that we would be changed from this moment forward. We pray, God, that you would give us uh, sharp minds and soft hearts, that we would understand this uh, text, this text that's been debated for years, and um, God, that it would not just be mere information for us, but you really would soften our hearts, that this would be a worshipful time for us. God, we need your spirit to do this. Uh, would you shape us as a church in this? Jesus, would we see you for all of your glory and for how beautiful you are? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, church, do you guys remember uh, a few years ago, I think it was 2015, if I remember right, um, that there was a, a picture that kind of went viral on social media. It spread rapidly. I actually have a picture of it for you, uh, if we can throw it up here. Anybody remember this? It was called The Dress, all right? You guys remember this? If you don't remember, what happened uh, was that there was a picture of this dress that went viral, okay? And the reason it did was because there was a picture of a dress that some people looked at the picture and said, that is a black and blue dress. Other people were looking at the exact same picture and saying, that is a white and gold dress. You guys remember this? You remember what team you were on? White and gold, black and blue. Okay. Um, but what was crazy, and this kind of phenomenon blew up because people were looking at the exact same picture, right? Like this wasn't two different pictures that people were getting. It was the same exact picture of the same exact dress, yet people were coming to very different interpretations and perceptions of it. I mean, black and blue, white and gold, not even really that close, right? And people later came out and said, well, you know, because of lighting and certain features, like we perceive colors a little bit differently. And so that's why we can look at the exact same thing, but have different interpretations. Well, I thought of that this week because as I was studying for our passage that we're about to read, uh, we're entering into this little mini section in the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's really six sections, six topics that Jesus is going to talk about. And what I found while I was studying this is that this section, people, Christians, scholars, will look at the exact same words the exact same paragraph, the exact same teaching of Jesus, and they come to very, very different conclusions. And I think that can be hard for us, or the temptation maybe for us as a church is to hear that, or maybe when you've come to like a tough passage in the Bible, you'll see that and you'll see different interpretations, and we can start to think, well, who could really even know what is right? Well, you ever thought that with a tough passage? You look at it, you hear different viewpoints, and you kind of think, well, how can we even be confident? Maybe we can never actually know what Jesus was trying to say. Or maybe we'll go so far to say, maybe it's not even that important to figure out what Jesus was actually trying to say. However, at the end of the day, that dress was a particular color. Right? Like you may perceive it certain ways, the dress was black and blue, okay? And if you're a white and gold person, I'm sorry. That's not my opinion, that's fact. Like the, the company said, this is a black and blue dress, all right? So it wasn't anything that kind of whoever saw it, whatever you perceive it to be might be true. Your perception, that might be true, but the dress is actually a certain color. And so too, as a church, I don't think it's healthy or wise for us to say, look, there's a lot of people that disagree about things in the Bible. And so kind of what, what you say might be right for you, what I say might be right for me, we actually believe here 
that there is a true meaning uh, behind these words. That Jesus is actually trying to communicate something. Now, when we come to these passages, we always want to be humble, right? We can't say definitively that we have all the right answers all the time, but we as a church should do the work to try to figure out, is there a good reason for a particular view? And I think what we're about to hit tonight, um, it, there's a lot of different interpretations, a lot of different views on how this works. And, and we're going to communicate that we think there actually is a right view, and we think it really matters. And what you're going to find out is that it doesn't just matter for one little issue, but this is actually going to affect how we see the entire Bible. And not only that, but our eternity. And so that's what we're going to be looking at in this passage tonight. Now, um, I'm going to teach kind of the, the viewpoint that we hold to and why we believe that. Uh, but I wanted to hit one, what we would say is a misinterpretation of this passage. All right. And, and there's a lot of different ones, but we want to hit one because this one's pretty prevalent. And I would guess actually, uh, maybe not a lot, but a good number of us in this room probably have this viewpoint when we come to a passage like this. So one of the main interpretations of this section is that Jesus is teaching us in this Sermon on the Mount that the Old Testament was really all about external laws and behaviors, right? Anybody, oh, you don't have to raise your hand, but maybe, maybe that's kind of your mindset. Your default is, yeah, Old Testament is about uh, external things. God in the Old Testament really cared about the outside, but Jesus in the New Testament, he's a little different. He actually cares about the internal. He cares about the heart. So we have God in the Old Testament as outside external behavior. Jesus in the New Testament is kind of inside internal heart level stuff. And one of the reasons that people believe that is because we're going to see this repeated structure over the next six weeks. We'll see something like this. Uh, Jesus will say, you have heard that it was said and then give some sort of Old Testament teaching. But then he's going to say, but I say to you, and he's going to give a different explanation. So what most or many people think is what he's doing is saying the Old Testament is all about the external, but I'm going to give you a new law. I'm going to tell you something different, and I'm going to be about the heart. Now, we think that's uh, an incorrect interpretation for a lot of different reasons. Let me give you two main ones. All right, because as, when we come to hard passages, the first thing you got to do is figure out what does the context say? Like, what does the actual passages around this say? Two things. If you got your Bibles open in Matthew 5, remember with me or look back to the passage we hit last week. If you remember back to last week, Jesus just said, I did not come to abolish the law. Right? So he said, not a dot or an iota, not one little bit of the law did I come to abolish. You know, in fact, he says, I didn't come to tear anything down in the Old Testament. I'm not against the Old Testament. I came to fulfill the Old Testament. He's saying, I came to be what the heart of the Old Testament is. Right? So right away, we should say, well, then that doesn't really make sense that he would be tearing down the Old Testament. So that's one thing. But second, remember back to what Jared said last week. He, he hit on verse 20. When Jesus uses the scribes and the Pharisees as an example, right? And he says that there is a deeper righteousness than what they have that you need. You guys remember this? He said, you need something deeper than what they are doing and what they are teaching. Now, they were the religious leaders of the day. They were the ones teaching the Old Testament law. And Jesus saying that there's something a little bit off with what they, how they understand righteousness. So let's put these two things together. Jesus doesn't hate the Old Testament. He said, I came to fulfill the Old Testament. But he's signaling to us that your religious leaders that are teaching and leading you, there's something a little bit off on how they view righteousness. So here's what I want to suggest to you guys. And we'll put this up on the screen too. Here's, here's how I think we understand this. Jesus is not correcting God's Old Testament law. Jesus is correcting teaching on God's Old Testament law. All right, that's going to be pivotal for the next six weeks. So write that down, do whatever you have to do. Jesus is not correcting God's Old Testament law. Jesus is correcting the teaching on God's Old Testament law. All right, so from the passage last week, he's not against the law. However, he alludes to the fact that the religious leaders of the day seem to have missed something. 
They don't seem to have it exactly right. What I want to suggest is Jesus is saying, there's not a problem with the Old Testament. There's a problem with their teaching on the Old Testament. And for the next six weeks, we are going to be looking at his examples that he gives us of what true righteousness actually looks like and the heart of the Old Testament. And today, we're going to start with a common teaching from the Ten Commandments on murder. All right, so all of that is kind of my premise. That's the the baseline, what we need to understand for the next six weeks. Now, for today, what I want to do is basically show you from the example in our passage that that is true, okay? And then we're going to talk about what that means for us as a church today. So as we look at his teaching, uh, if you got your Bible, Matthew 5, we're going to start in verse 21. Uh, We're going to see two things in this passage. Uh, First, Jesus is going to confront us with our sin, and then he's going to confront us with our need for reconciliation. All right, so if you've got two words for today, think sin and think reconciliation. All right, that's where we're going today. So if you've got a Bible, let's read verses 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Okay, so again, at face value, what it looks like Jesus might be saying there is, hey, the Old Testament said, don't murder or you're going to be judged. But in my kingdom, we care about the heart. Okay, so if you got a bad heart, you're going to be judged. So I get it. On face value, it kind of looks like Old Testament versus this like New Testament Jesus heart level law. But let's look at it a little bit more carefully, all right? So two things I want you to notice from verse 21. So look at verse 21. The first thing, notice the phrase that Jesus introduces this teaching with. Okay, so he says, you have heard that it was said. Okay, now that's important. Because everywhere else where Jesus quotes the Old Testament, he doesn't say this. He says the phrase, it is written. Right? That was a common phrase that people, when they wanted to quote Old Testament scripture, they would say, it is written. All right, so for instance, if any of you remember back to last year when we hit Matthew chapter 4, basically a year ago, if you remember back to the temptations of Jesus, um, the, uh, Satan is tempting Jesus, and when he quotes scripture to fight temptation, he says, Matthew 4, 4, it is written. Matthew 4, 7, it is written. Matthew 4, 10, it is written. And when he says that, he gives a direct quote to the Old Testament. All right, so right away, again, we should be thinking, Okay, well, that's different. He doesn't say it is written. He says, you have heard that it was said, which should put something in our brain of maybe something's a little different. Now, second, my second observation, that whole phrase that comes after it. So after he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, that whole next phrase is not an Old Testament quote. All right, so the first part is a direct quote. You shall not murder. That's from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. That's a 10 commandment. You shall not murder. But that whole second part of that phrase is not an Old Testament quote. That doesn't come right after it. So I think here's what he's saying. He's not saying that this phrase is the correct understanding of the law, that this is a direct quote from the Old Testament. Instead, he's saying, this is what you've heard your teacher say to you. All right, so think about it that way, that he's saying, this is the teaching that you have heard. Now, why does that matter? Because that would mean Jesus is not quoting the Old Testament and saying, let me give you a new law. He's saying, your religious leaders have said this, but let me correctly teach that law. I think that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's teaching us that the Pharisees and religious leaders, they took the letter of the law in the Old Testament but they shrunk it down to the easiest possible way to obey it. So they were teaching, as long as you don't physically end someone's life, you won't be judged. You're going to be fine. You're righteous if you don't kill somebody. And why would they do that? Like, why would you do that? Because if you can shrink the law down to the technical letter of the law, it makes it a lot easier for you to feel righteous about yourself. 
right? Like I would guess most of us in this room would say, if the law is purely not to kill somebody, righteous, right? Like I can attain righteousness that Jesus was talking about. They assumed, the Pharisees that is, that if they don't physically take someone's life, then they could be righteous in God's eyes. And think about how often we do this. I mean, how often do we do this? We look at the commandments of God and we justify our behavior by saying, technically, I have not broken the commandment. You know, technically, we didn't have sex before marriage. Yeah, we lived together, we slept in the same bed, we acted like we were married, we did kind of everything else physically, but technically, we didn't have sex before marriage. So righteous, right? Or maybe we say, technically, you know, I didn't cheat on my taxes. Like, I know that God says to honor the government, to pay to Caesar what is Caesar's, but I found these loopholes. The government might be okay with it. You know, they may have never noticed. The government's corrupt anyway, so technically I haven't disobeyed God's law. What we're doing is we're stripping away the heart of the law to try to fulfill the exact wording of the law so that we can feel righteous about our behavior and obedience to the law. But Jesus is saying here, this is not the type of righteousness that God is after. He is and has always been after our heart. The Pharisees thought they could externally keep the letter of the law, miss the entire heart of the law, and then not face judgment and be righteous. Let me maybe drive this home with an illustration. Uh, in my family's house, at our house, we have um, kind of a decent sized front lawn for being in the city and a big driveway. But one of the problems is we don't have a, a sidewalk, all right? So it's just like our lawn and driveway directly onto the street. Uh, so our son, Jay, he's three years old. When he's playing out in the front, uh, which is fine, but it could be dangerous because the street's fairly busy. So imagine that I go to him and I say, hey, Jet, you can play in the front yard, uh, but don't run into the street or else you're going to get in trouble. All right. Jet, my son, wanting to follow the law, decides I don't want to get in trouble. I want to obey my dad. So I am not going to run into the street. But he decides I could probably walk into the street. Like I could slowly walk into the street and I'm not running into the street. Or I can get on my little balance bike and start at the top of the driveway and just ride that thing straight into the street, but I'm not running into the street. Or I could even get in my dad's car, pop that thing into reverse, slam on the gas and drive my car into the street, but I'm not running into the street. All the while he's thinking, I'm doing exactly what my dad told me to do. Right now, obviously, none of us would go and say, great job obeying the law, right? Because what he's done is maybe technically obeyed what I said, but missed the entire point. All those things are technically keeping my command, but actually breaking my command, right? That's what Jesus is getting at here. God's not mainly concerned about his people uh, doing the least amount of obedience that we can. He gave them laws that have a heart of righteousness behind them that he's calling us to. And Jesus says here, he's teaching us that the heart of the law not to murder is not merely a prohibition on you not killing somebody, taking somebody's life. The heart of the law is that we would actually honor life, value life, give dignity to image bearers of God. That's the heart of the law. True righteousness is not just restraining yourself from killing somebody. It's giving value, honor, dignity, and worth to somebody because they were made in God's image. So if you look at verse 22, Jesus is saying really the heart of the law is that if you have like this unrighteous anger towards someone, uh, when there's wrath in your heart towards another person, when you lash out in anger towards somebody, he says, you've actually broken the law not to murder. If you insult someone, he says, that word could be like uh, abuse. So if, you, if with your words you kind of tear somebody down or abuse somebody, he's saying that's chipping away at their value and worth as an image bearer of God. And if you insult people, that's breaking the law not to murder. He said if you call someone a fool, right, and that word, it, it means it, you, it's like a demeaning phrase to call someone empty-headed or an idiot or stupid, it's basically belittling someone, seeming like they're worse than you are. He said, if you do that, you've broken the law not to murder. 
Because in God's kingdom, not just in the New Testament, but the entire heart of the law of God's kingdom, is that righteousness means showing value, worth, and dignity to all image bearers all the time. And any time we strip away somebody's value and dignity as an image bearer, whether that be physically, emotionally, verbally, or even in our thoughts or our heart, he says, you are unrighteous and will be judged. So what does that mean for us right now if we think about that? It means there's not one of us in here who hasn't broken the law, you shall not murder. Because the heart of the law is to continually value life and we have not done it. When we look at the heart of murder, which is anger, thinking someone's beneath you, this prideful sense that you're better than somebody, gossiping about them, insulting them in front of them or behind their back, it says we're all breaking the heart of this law. And if that is the standard, there's not one of us in here who would say that we're righteous. Right? Like if, if, the, if we go by the Pharisees' understanding, most of us would probably say, righteous. I haven't murdered somebody. I'm righteous. But Jesus says you need a greater righteousness than that to enter the kingdom of God. And if that's a righteousness we need, that is a righteousness we don't have. And Jesus is teaching us that for all those who are unrighteous in this way, do not deserve the kingdom of God, but he says we deserve judgment of hell. So what then shall we do? If that's our sin, right? He's showing us that this is not just for a few physical murderers. This is for all people who have not valued life as we should. What do we do? Well, praise be to God. Jesus doesn't just leave it there, right? He offers us hope. And he offers hope for those who can acknowledge their sin before him. Right? He starts with the sin because this hope does not come unless you're willing to acknowledge your sin. If we can acknowledge our sinful hearts before God, Jesus has a call for you. And the rest of the passage is really two different pictures talking about the urgent need for murderers like us to be reconciled. All right? He says, your sin needs reconciliation. All right, if that's a new word for you, that idea of reconciled, um, just think it, it just means um, two things that might be fractured or broken. To reconcile that is to like bring those into agreement or harmony or unity. All right. And our sinful hearts have actually caused a, a break in two different sets of relationships. One, it causes a break in our vertical relationship with God. But two, Jesus says that also causes horizontal relationships with others a break. And so he says we actually need reconciliation on both accounts. So if you got your Bibles again, look down. Uh, verses 23 and 24 is going to give us one picture. 25 and 26 will give us a second picture. Um, but both of those are showing us God's heart for sinful people to be reconciled. This is the hope that we can have. And I think what he's going to teach us is that there's an urgent need here um, that if we don't do this, our, our worship is at risk and our eternity is at risk. So those are kind of the two pictures. So first, he's going to tell us our worship is at risk if we do not have our sin reconciled. Look at verse 23. He says, so with all that being said, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, here's our word, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Okay, so the scene that Jesus is painting in this picture is someone who has come to worship God. All right, now the, the, uh, the, the offering or the way that they're worshiping is kind of disputed. Some people think it's a financial offering they're giving. Other people think it's like a, a sacrificial uh, animal that they're coming to like sacrifice as part of a sin offering or something. Either way, what we know is that this is a person coming to the place of God to worship God. And he's saying, if you come to worship God, and let's say you're, you know, cutting up your goat, right? You got blood everywhere. You're sacrificing to the Lord, and you remember... I actually said demeaning words to my coworkers all week this week. He says, leave your gift there. Leave the goat on the altar. Leave your financial gift, whatever it is. And he says, first, before you come to worship me, I want you to go and be reconciled. Because what he's saying is, it is hypocrisy 
to think that we can worship God vertically while ignoring relationships horizontally. So Providence, don't miss the weight of this. Jesus is telling us that God does not want and will not tolerate our hypocritical worship. He will not take it. Meaning that if we come here every Sunday and we think that we are good because we come and you know we, we hold our spouse's hand and we sing the songs and raise our arms, how great thou art, and we're taking notes and we come forward to take communion. We do all this stuff because we think we can engage with the Lord vertically and yet have a wreckage of human relationships in our life Monday through Saturday. God says, I do not want this worship on Sunday. And if you think maybe I'm taking this verse a little extreme, I just want to remind you that that is a consistent teaching of God to his people throughout the entire Bible. Let me just give you a few examples. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, beginning of the Bible. Genesis 4, there's two brothers, Cain and Abel. They both come to sacrifice to the Lord, yet God says there's a problem with Cain's sacrifice. He doesn't actually want it. Why? Because there's a problem with his heart. There's something going on in his life with how he's viewing this that God says, I don't want your worship if it is hypocritical. Okay, you can fast forward in the the prophet Isaiah chapter one. God is telling his people, he said, look, you've come to worship. You come to pray and to sing and to do all this stuff for me. Yet you are living in injustice and oppression of the poor. God says, I do not want your worship anymore. He said, if you're going to live in injustice, I don't want you to come and worship me. Uh, Amos chapter 5, it's a crazy one. The prophet Amos, just read through it this week. God says, look, you've come, you're singing, you're praying, you're doing all the worship. God says, I hate it. Think about that. He's not talking about pagan nations worshiping. He's saying, these people have come with the scriptures to worship Yahweh. And he says, I hate it. It stinks to me because they're living the rest of their week in hypocrisy. He said, I don't want your worship if the rest of your life and all of your relationships are marked by sin and unhealth. Jesus' teaching here isn't new. He's saying, look, if you've got anger deep in your heart, you've got murderous thoughts in your heart, and you have not taken care of those, he says, I don't want you to come and worship. You know, a couple weeks ago, we just celebrated Martin Luther King Day. Right? One of the things that he preached and stood for was that he saw Christians trying to engage with the Lord vertically on Sundays, yet throughout the whole week they, they hated other people. They looked down on other people because of their race or ethnicity. And honestly, I think some of us come here on Sundays thinking, I can worship God, I can have the vertical aspect, yet have a wreckage of relationships horizontally. And Jesus is saying, that's not what God wants. He will not tolerate our hypocritical worship. Some of us are probably here, and we still struggle with what we just celebrated on MLK MLK Day. That we come here and we think, I can worship God vertically while thinking I'm better than other people because of their culture, race, or ethnicity. Jesus says that's absurd. Right? Some of us, maybe it's like an economic thing where we, we can sit here and we worship, yet when we look at other people in the church or outside and we say, we see them, maybe they're, they're, they're poor. Maybe they don't have as much as we do and we think, man, they must have made a mess of their life. Right? Like we look down on people immediately, not knowing anything about them, yet we come here and we think that we can just worship God. He says, I'm not going to put up with that. Or maybe it's Maybe it's vice versa for you. Maybe you come here and you have this mindset that anybody who's wealthy or rich or your boss, they just scammed their way to the top. And we have these thoughts at the depths of our heart, yet think somehow we can separate that from our worship of God. Jesus says that's absurd. I've talked to so many people where we wrestle with this, where we say, man, I come to church, I'm trying to read my Bible, I'm just disconnected from God. Yet the whole time we ignore the fact that there's nothing but sin at the depths of our heart. Jesus says those two things will always be together. Jesus says if you can recognize your sin, it is imperative that we work towards reconciliation because our worship of God is at risk. But he goes on to give us one more uh, in these last couple verses, uh, one more picture where I think he's going to tell us it's not only your worship that's at risk, uh, but if we don't actually work toward reconciliation, it is your eternity at risk. 
Uh, Jesus is going to give us this picture, and he kind of ups the ante a little bit. Now, look at verses 25 and 26. Uh, some people will argue that this is just speaking about the physical court system and legal system. Again, with the whole context, that may be right, but I think Jesus is giving us a picture of something greater here. Uh, so read 25 and 26. It says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. I think what Jesus is giving us here is a picture showing us that we must be reconciled or we will face a judge where we will face punishment. You know, we look at this here, he says, you will have to pay for every last penny. There's not a little thing that will just kind of go um, by the wayside or that will slide by this righteous judge. So if we think of um, our sins are not just horizontal, but our horizontal sins are actually sins against a creator God. Jesus is saying here, all those horizontal sins will actually have to get dealt with with the ultimate judge. And when we think that we can kind of have these little sins that maybe aren't a big deal, I think Jesus is showing us here that all of those need to be reconciled or we will be in God's judgment forever. You know, all those little, like, our, our little gossip, our little outbursts at home or at work, our little comments belittling someone, our little fits of road rage towards someone else, our little sins, Jesus says, is going to cost us Big time. It's not just our worship that is at risk. He says you will be found guilty before a righteous judge facing an eternal punishment. So if that's the case, if, if these are the things that are at risk, then what does reconciliation actually look like? What's the, the hope or the call for us as his people? Uh, well, as I just said, I think first, there's kind of two things, those two relationships that we need to work toward. Uh, first, while we do sin horizontally uh, and relationally against people, the Bible teaches those sins really are primarily against God. Right? As we demean others, we treat people less than ourselves, we lash out in unrighteous anger, that affects others and is a sin against others, but ultimately that sin is against the creator of that image bearer. And the great punishment and judgment that we face will not ultimately just be from that other person, but it's actually from a righteous God. And Jesus is pointing us to that fact, not to just stick his finger in your chest saying, you are a filthy, unrighteous sinner. But this teacher, Jesus, he goes on to not just say that you need to figure out how to be reconciled, but the gospel story is that he goes on to actually do the work of reconciliation for us. You know, he doesn't just tell us you got to get right with God. He actually does the work of getting you right with God because the king who commands righteousness is the man who earned righteousness. Jesus goes on. We'll see this chapter after chapter in Matthew. He never disobeyed the heart of this law. He always saw people as image bearers. He always acted in love and compassion, never demeaning anybody. Yet at the end of Jesus' life, he didn't face this celebratory party for his righteousness. He faced a cross. Right? And why does Jesus face a cross at the end of his life? Because on that cross, the Father sent him there to pay the penalty for all of our unrighteousness. So I want you to consider this. If you can, reflect every time you've lashed out in anger. Just let some of those thoughts come to your mind. Where you've just responded at an instant in anger. Every time you said a demeaning word to somebody, when you insulted somebody in front of them or maybe behind their back, every time you had an unrighteous thought against somebody, every, every time anything crossed your mind that was demeaning to somebody. So like the billions of times that we've sinned in this area. On the cross, Jesus did not just look at those sins, he actually took those sins. Think about the billions of times that you've sinned in this area. And on the cross, the Father did not look at Jesus as this righteous, perfect son, but he looked at him as unrighteous. He saw him as a murderer on the cross. And Jesus on the cross paid the penalty for all of those unrighteous sins. 
You know, you can, as the Pharisees tried to do, to make yourself righteous. You can try to hide those sins. You can try to hide those thoughts. You can try to make yourself look good. And Jesus said, you'll never get into the kingdom that way because a righteousness that you can earn is not a righteousness that you need. You need something other than what you have. And that is what Jesus came to do. He's pointing his finger at you saying, you are unrighteous, not to make you feel bad, but to actually call you to give him your unrighteousness so that he can offer you perfect righteousness. This is the call of what Jesus has done. He's not saying wallow in shame and guilt. He's saying take that unrighteousness and lay it at the foot of the cross. You know, this week, just a couple of days ago, um, maybe Friday, I, I had planned to do this stuff with, with my two boys. And right at the last minute, as we were about to go, uh, my three-year-old Jet, he just freaked out. I mean, utterly lost it. Like I was trying to get him in the car to go somewhere and he lost it. I mean, he was screaming, yelling, crying, the whole thing. I just did not want to go. Uh, and in that moment, as he's freaking out, I snapped. Like I just lost, I just yelled at him because I just something at the depths of my soul came out and I lashed out in anger at him. And you know, a couple minutes after that, I thought, man, this passage just like blossomed in my soul that deep down at my core, I am not this good, righteous person. I just saw that what is down there is anger. I mean, I thought, what kind of man snaps at a three-year-old boy? Like I saw at the depth, you know, all of us, we spend so much time trying to tell ourselves that we're good, trying to make everyone else think that we're good. And in that moment, I just felt the weight of there is just sin at the depth of my soul. You know, and we listened to this song as we were driving that we're actually going to sing here in a few minutes. Um, and one of the lines of the song says, uh, talking about God, it says, he welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. You know, in that moment, I know that I can usually tend to think, man, how good of it is God to welcome those vile people? Man, that's a good God. And in that moment, I was struck to the core of saying, man, it's not good. The vileness is not out there. The vileness is in here. Like the wickedness is actually at the core of my being. But the next line of that song goes, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And I just felt the mercy of God for my soul. Like a man that would freak out at a three-year-old boy, he would come for me. Like I'm not good. There's depth of sin in my soul. And if we get to that place, you're actually in the one spot where you are the person Jesus came for. Where Jesus actually came to save your soul. Yes, you may have many sins, but his mercy is more. I want to call you tonight, maybe if you've never actually trusted in Jesus, where you've tried to live hiding some of that sin, kind of pushing that sin deep down into your heart, if you would actually bring that to the surface tonight and give that to Jesus. He doesn't call you to behave certain ways. He calls you first and foremost to enter his kingdom through his righteousness. We first must be reconciled to God, and that is what he has done for us in Christ. But secondly, I don't want us to miss um, that the emphasis of this passage is also not just being reconciled with Christ, but an actual emphasis on being reconciled with each other. Uh, Jesus doesn't say that his people are going to be perfect, right? Just because you're a Christian, you believe in the mercy of God, doesn't mean you're going to live your life without problems. But what he does say is that if we've trusted in the mercy of God for our sins, we can actually live in a way that confesses that sin, that owns that sin, and that works towards reconciling on a horizontal level. So let me just say very simply, uh, what this means I think is not that you have to you know, live your whole life every moment trying to figure out every little sin, um, but as the Lord shows you and reveals to you sins horizontally, what would it be like if we were a people that just had a spirit of reconciliation? where we didn't try to just hide those sins, where we didn't maybe even just confess vertically, but that we took this passage seriously and said, I'm not going to try to hide those things and worship vertically. I'm going to actually chase those things down. He says, if you are the one who has sinned, it's on you to go and reconcile. What I think this means is to the best of our ability, would we be a people that own sin, confess sin, and if you're on the receiving end of that, would we model the Lord Jesus by being a people of grace, forgiveness, and mercy? So uh, tangibly, we're going to put this into practice, all right? So um, I, I would invite the band up, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper here in a moment. Um, 
but I want to call us to actually take these words seriously. All right, so here's what I want you to do. First, um, if you've never trusted in Jesus, this is a meal for those who have come to know and trust Jesus. Um, So if that's maybe not you up until this point, I want to encourage you and urge you. Would you actually give your unrighteousness, your anger, and that sin to Jesus tonight? Um, There's nothing else that you can do for that. There's no other remedy and cure for that unrighteous anger in your heart. You can try to make yourself feel better, and that depth will be there until Jesus washes you with mercy. So would you receive that tonight? Would you actually lay that before Jesus and trust in him? And if that's you, I want to call you to actually come forward and take communion tonight. Tell somebody else around you that you want to trust in Jesus and have all of your unrighteousness, your sin, and your anger put on the cross and to receive his mercy. But second, and maybe more difficult for most of us, I want to encourage us to take these words seriously. And before you come forward in an act of worship to receive communion, um, I want you to actually consider and pray through if there is some sort of reconciliation that you need to do. Um, And that uh, that may mean for you tonight that you actually don't take communion. That you would say, I'm going to take this seriously, and before I come in this act of worship, I'm going to make sure that I pursue reconciliation. For others of you, what that may mean is just a simple, you're going to turn to my spouse and say, man, I feel the conviction of how I talked to you this week, and I need to apologize. I need to own that sin and say I'm sorry. And if if you're the person receiving that, I want to, again, encourage you to model what we do up here for communion, which is give grace and mercy and forgiveness. For others of you, that may mean getting up, walking across the room, tapping someone on the shoulder and say, hey, I know that I have sinned against you and we need to take care of this before we come forward and take communion. And I get it. It could be weird. I know it's like, well, what are people going to think if I don't take communion, whatever? And let me just say, who cares? Right? Like we have to be a people that please the Lord. And he is saying, I do not want your acts of worship until you work towards reconciliation. If that's a quick five minute phone call in the back, whatever that may be. Now, that may not be all of us. That may not even be many of us. But if through this time, the Lord has put something on your heart where you know there is someone or something that I need to take care of, I want to encourage you, take these words seriously. Take care of it. And if it takes two minutes and then you come forward, great. If that means just this week, I'm not going to take communion until this gets reconciled, then great. But I just want to encourage you, would you actually take these words seriously? Would we work towards reconciliation? And then for all those, and this may be most of us, would you then come forward and just remember the grace and mercy of Jesus? That even though we have many sins, his mercy is more for us. Let me pray. Father, you are so good that you would take sinners Murderers like us, even though most of us have probably not physically taken someone's life, we have chipped away at somebody's dignity. We have insulted somebody's value. We have uh, looked at ourselves as better than other people for a thousand different reasons. We've not valued life and honored you in the process, but God, you have given us mercy and grace. Would we feel a sense of hope that your son has died for very people like us, that it's not just the, the, the externally righteous who get to come forward for communion. It's not the externally righteous that make up your family. It's the unrighteous who have fallen at the feet of the cross, who have said that we are solely dependent on your mercy and grace. Would you free us? God, I pray right now for the spirit to move and maybe people's heart where it is just hard to feel free to confess our sins, to just give all of that up. Or maybe we feel like we need to appear a certain way or attain a certain sort of external righteousness. Would we as a church find such freedom in knowing that we are sinful, we have broken your laws. That's the point of the gospel. There's a point of why you came. We are a people, not that are externally good, but have been changed internally by your son. God, I pray right now for for anything that needs to happen. Uh, I pray that you would uh, move and convict if there needs to be conversations, if there needs to be a withholding 
from communion, I pray that you would do that for people right now, that we would take these words seriously. You gave us this word to follow and obey, and so God, would we do that right now? Um, Would people experience the freedom and the life that comes from confession and repentance and reconciliation? And then, God, would you hear our worship of you? We want to sing your praises and offer great worship because we have a great God who has made us into his people. So God, would this be a time of worship of you, of reconciliation, um, and, and would you just work in us now? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.